Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Sanjeev Mehra, and I welcome all the viewers today once again on the Beyond Sugar uh, social media handles. Uh, today, I am joined with Dr. Jashri Gopal as well. Ma'am, uh, you're welcome uh, on the platform. Uh, before we move forward, uh, as you all aware that uh, Beyond Sugar platform has been created uh, along, alongside Research Society for Study of Diabetes in India, as well as Indian Society of Nephrology. And the purpose is very clear that we keep on sharing the information with all the viewers which are following this platform uh, on a daily basis so that you are fully aware and you are getting the accurate information about the diabetes and the related things which you know, which you, you would like to know as a patient or as a caregiver. In the same context, not only we keep you abreast with the latest information, but we also invite leading doctors and experts from across the country. And in the same sequence, with the same purpose, today we have with us Dr. Jashree. Uh, I think this will be a great occasion when she would be able to connect straight away directly with you and all the questions which would be there in your mind you would be able to get right answers for that we have been you know talking about various subjects uh, in the past uh, today we are going to talk about a very very interesting uh, thing and uh, the subject is about around the hygiene and the hygiene matters in diabetes why this matters because all of us are aware that diabetes is going to, you know, it's a state which probably is going to stay uh, with anyone who has it uh, almost lifelong. And it is very important that we know how to manage our body and how to live along with this. And, and we know what are the things which we have to take care of. Dr. Jashree has been very kind to uh, take out her time today. Uh, let me introduce her before I uh, hand over the stage to her for her opening remarks. She's a very noted and a senior endocrinologist in the city of Chennai and, and a popular figure there and everyone knows her. Uh, she's been a founder of Diabando India Foundation, which has a motto uh, of you know, preserving health across generations. And I'm sure today she's going to you know, answer uh, all the answers you know, based on that. She has done her diplomate in American board in internal medicine and diabetes and she has a lot of awards uh, to her credit and she has been awarded with the jp moses oration as well uh, at the api in chennai uh, now without much ado uh, ma'am i welcome you here and i hand over the stage to you for your opening remarks before we move forward and take the other questions yeah thank you very much mr sanjeev it's indeed a pleasure to be here and uh... Uh, you know, before we started this session, you were talking about how this was set up and first of all, kudos to this whole initiative. I think it's wonderful that we have a platform in which we can engage with, uh, with patients outside the clinic in an educational aspect. Um, so, and for those of you who are new to this, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, sort of type of talk, these are regular talks apparently which happen. And maybe Sanjeev can talk a little bit more about it. But I just wanted to mention two things. One is, please go on to the Facebook page and you know like so that you get regular notifications. Second is, uh, a recording of this and previous videos will be available on a YouTube channel. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that because today is a very niche topic. So I don't want people to feel that you know we're not talking about the commonly discussed aspects of diabetes. I'm not going to be talking about diet and exercise. And, and medications and management and things like that. It was a very interesting topic and I picked it because it, it was a unique topic. The title was Hygiene Matters and Diabetes. And uh, uh, honestly, I, you know, I had to think a little bit about it, wondering what is it that we need to talk about. And you know, as we go through the conversation, we'll, we'll talk about various aspects of hygiene and diabetes. But obviously the main reason why hygiene does matter uh, is because people with diabetes are more prone to infections, particularly when their sugars are not under control. I think that awareness is clearly there, that people with diabetes are more prone to urinary tract infections, people with diabetes are more prone to skin infections, foot infections. While that awareness is there, is there a way that we can prevent it beyond blood sugar control? Is there a way we can reduce our risk of developing these complications? And uh, today I'm here to share some little uh, uh, you know, tips or little practical points 
And if anybody has an, their own sort of insight also, please leave it in the comment box so that we can uh, discuss it. So I think I'll stop with that, Sanjeev. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, very nice uh, uh, of you to, you know, share this context that, you know, whenever we talk about diabetes, it's, you know, largely we are concerned about the blood sugars. And even if you're talking of hygiene, I think it's mostly we talk about the infections and all. But I think when it comes to uh, hygiene uh, matters, uh, I think our whole body is like, you know, head to toe and you have to take care of, you know, each and everything, not only the major things, but even the minor, minor things, uh, uh, which will, you know, occur uh, day to day. So let's let's begin, uh, you know, with a very basic question that uh, why it is, you know, hygiene is important for everyone. So it's not like, you know, for diabetes or for anything you need to. Pre but is there anything, is there any specific reason that, you know, a diabetic patient needs to be a little more aware about the hygiene matters and it, it can make a, a big difference in, you know, how he can manage himself? So I think uh, partly, like I mentioned earlier, people with poorly controlled diabetes have a uh, more prone to infections. And this happens because sugar, uh, just as much as we love sugar, bacteria and, and you know other microorganisms also love sugar. So when they see any place which has high sugar, uh, whether it's in the blood or in the urine or various other parts of our body, infections can uh, get set up there very quickly. I think uh, a lot of the audience will be aware that normally itself, we have bacteria living in our body. We have bacteria living in our skin and our in our gut. And that is what we call the good microbiome. This is the bacteria that actually helps us and looks after us. However, when we have diabetes uh, or if we get exposed to infections, then this and the sugar levels are high, these sort of bad bacteria take over and they can set up infection. And uh, people with diabetes are more prone. I think during the COVID, people must have been aware that people with uh, diabetes were more prone to complications, for example, from COVID, because it drops your immunity. So not only are you more prone to catching infections, but the infections you catch are also more severe. So for this reason, hygiene matters are probably even more important in people with diabetes. It's important for everybody. Not only people with diabetes, I would also say uh, the family members of people with diabetes. Quite often in the COVID time, I've had family members tell me, you know, particularly children, uh, you know, with parents who are older, tell me, oh, you know, we didn't go out because I didn't want to go out and catch COVID and come back because my mother has diabetes or my father has diabetes. So I didn't want to give it to them because they understood the importance. That is also a form of, I would say, hygiene, because you're trying to break the chain of transmission of infection. So understanding why we are more prone and the fact that we are more prone to severe infection, I think makes it more imperative that people with diabetes are more invested in their hygiene matters. Yeah, no, thank you very much for explaining that in, in you know, simple words. And I think two things I definitely pick up that uh, bacteria is also like uh, sugar and there is mm -hmm. a greater possibility of, you know, uh, uh, you know, bacteria is harming you. And then the other thing is that you need to be careful that the immunity also may be lower and therefore, you know, you're more prone to uh, uh, getting, you know, into that trap. So let's talk about, you know, how these bacteria commonly, you know, may go inside you. So it's while, you know, someone is eating or, you know, through the hands or, or, you know, the, the upper part of the body through, you know, the, so anything specific, you know, you'd like to ma'am guide uh, the patients on how to take care of, you know, the basic hand hygiene or, you know, the mouth hygiene or, you know, uh, the ear or nose, you know, which are most, you know, uh, vulnerable to, you know, these things. Exactly. So uh, our body is, first of all, extremely wonderful at helping us retain the good bacteria and keep out the bad bacteria. And the skin is where it all starts. The skin is the most sort of effective barrier between us and, you know, bacteria. So obviously anything which breaches that barrier. So you have a little cut or you have skin dryness and you're scratching yourself and the skin gets upgraded. Um, it can be something as simple as a chapel bite. So you're wearing tight chapels and it keeps pressing on your skin and the skin gets upgraded. Something as simple as digging your nose, uh, digging your nose, yes, but also the ears more importantly. For example, you're trying to take out the dirt. In our country, commonly people use a safety pin. And you know, a little scratch that you can get with a safety pin is dangerous. Uh, I know ENT doctors will tell us, don't even bother removing the wax. We have this habit of, you know, in our country, 
parents getting their children and digging off the wax from the ears is very common. We also do it as we get older because we just want to feel clean even in that area. Do it, but do it at a relatively superficial level and use a good cotton bud and don't dig too deep inside because people with diabetes are prone to a very severe infection of the ear canal. Uh, any abrasion, any little cut uh, can potentially lead to a bad infection. So we have to be careful that we are not uh, overzealous in our efforts to clean ourselves. So that is, for example, with respect to the ear. And one other place I wanted to mention since we're talking about head and neck is a lot of people with diabetes have this darkness around the nape of the neck that's called acanthosis. Uh, that for us is a marker of insulin resistance. So you can see it quite commonly. Some people it will be very dark. For some people it will be a light gray in color. It's a thickening here. It is not dirt. I know so many instances where either parents come to me with their children saying, I think it is dirt and I've been trying to rub it or even people themselves because of the way that it looks uh, cosmetically, you know, they're not happy with the way it looks. So they try to really scrub it. And I've had dermatologists tell me the all sorts of things they've tried to do. You know, I've, I've, I've heard one dermatologist tell me that one patient that she saw had actually tried to put, you know, that metal scrubber that we use for blood uh, for, for the vessels to take out the grease. He was trying to rub it off using that metal scrubber and it had, you know, literally led to so much of scratches and bleeding. So just to point out that this thing here cannot be fixed by something on the outside. If you want to get rid of this acanthosis, it has to be from the inside. You have to lose weight. You have to make sure that your diet is healthy, that your sugar is good, that you're exercising. Maybe take certain medications that helps your body's insulin work better. So skin can get upgraded very easily. So we should not be overzealous in things like, again, digging the ears or scrubbing the neck. Mm. Oh, very small, small things, but so very vital, uh, you know, for, for a good health of a patient. And it is important not only that you you should save yourself, you know, from hurting yourself, but but mind you that, you know, it can actually, you know, it can trouble you for a long run because even the healing would be difficult, you know, if you get uh, some of these things. You mentioned about uh, the skin, you know, uh, the coloring, a different color around the neck, uh, and you know some other things. Anything specific, ma'am? When we, you know, hear about or talk to the diabetic patients, they generally feel that you know they are having you know more glucose or sugar content inside, and that may lead to, you know, some sort of you know itching on the screen or or, or you know different kind of it will be uh, some a different feeling or maybe you know itching in the head. Uh, so, so does diabetic patients or does diabetes lead to these kind of things that, you know, someone may be more itchy uh, on the skin or, or is it like a myth? If it is a fact, then, you know, uh, what are the conditions which a patient should be careful on and, you know, what is the best way to manage it? Yeah, it's an excellent question because uh, even people with well-controlled diabetes, if they suddenly notice a lot of skin itching, they have to think about whether their blood sugars have gone up. Anytime your blood sugars go up, you tend to have more itching of the skin. Uh, it's usually itching of the whole body. Uh, very rarely is it itching of the scalp. So apart from, you know, another very common reason for itching is, of course, apart from skin dryness and uh, uh, conditions like that and other allergies is thyroid problems. Thyroid problems tend to coexist, particularly hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid. So thyroid problems are very common in people with diabetes. Uh, so if you start itching, uh, think about whether your sugars may be high, get it checked. Even if it has been checked, say two, three months back and it was okay, remember to get it checked. Uh, if you have diabetes, have you been put on any new medication? Because any new medicine can cause itching. Has there been any change in, your, uh, in the soap that you use, whether it is in the soap that you use on your body or in the soap that you use in the clothes? Is there some change in your environment in the soap that you use on the bed sheets? Uh, so these are all common reasons why allergies develop and then thyroid. So we sort of go through a checklist as to why itching may occur. Apart from that, there are a number of other conditions. Kidney problems can cause itching. Liver problems can cause itching. So a wide variety of conditions can cause severe itching. Uh, but not to neglect itching, thinking that, you know, it's just itching. It can be a marker of something more, something as simple as, elevated sugars or thyroid or something more serious like a kidney or a liver problem. I think what is important is if you itch also, there are good medicines available to reduce the itch. Of course, scratching the itch is a very 
it's the sort of a reflex action. You cannot avoid it. If you start, you know, itching, normal thing is just to go and scratch it. That's the normal thing. But try not to scratch to the point where bleeding occurs. Try to take a medicine like anti-allergy medicines are available, which reduce the itching. You can apply uh, creams, moisturizing creams, if it's the skin dryness that is causing the problem. So try not to itch so much or scratch so much that you're causing the uh, bleeding. Is skin, uh, skin dryness a common occurrence in a diabetic patient? And if that is so, would it be wise to you know keep it properly oiled or moisturized? Any comments on that, ma'am? Absolutely, absolutely. It's very, very common, particularly for people who have had diabetes for a long time. The mm. diabetes also affects the nerves uh, that supply the glands that make the oil for the skin. So what we call the sebaceous glands and the other sebum producing glands which are present mm. in the skin. So mm. if the nerves and the blood flow to those glands are affected because of diabetes, the skin cannot make the normal sort of the, the liquid that it has to secrete to keep the skin moist. So skin dryness is a common problem. Of course, some parts of the body tend to be drier than others. So our feet tends to be very dry. Uh, hands and arms, exposed part of the bo part body tends to be dry, but it can be dry. A good general rule in our country, I would say, is uh, having an oil bath is a good way. So, you know, oil yourself before your bath and apply a moisturizing cream. Apply a thick moisturizing cream. Even something like paraffin wax is a good option. So paraffin wax is something after the bath uh, and, and make sure that you're safe with it. So for uh, older people, particularly when they apply paraffin wax on their feet, I tell them, put it, on, put it on, in the, on your feet in the night. If your heels are very dry, if the skin between the toes is very dry, apply something like paraffin wax or things which are thick and jelly-like. Apply that on your feet, but wear socks because you obviously don't want to go slipping because of the paraffin wax. Wear the socks and the socks also will keep the Vaseline in close contact with the skin, uh, you know, paraffin wax or Vaseline, whatever you're using in close contact with the skin. Mm. I personally find that creams alone may not be that helpful. So it's better to go for the gels. The gels are the ones that are helpful. And if you have very dry skin, apply oil before the bath, have your bath, apply this some like a paraffin wax type of gel after the bath. And that really helps to retain the moisture in the skin. Mm. Yeah, thank you for explaining. I think that wonderfully. I'm also. I think this is a, a, a probably you know something a subject which touches a lot of people. I'm getting questions on uh, on the same thing that is our rashes also common uh, occurrence you know on skin during diabetes, and if so, then what should be done? So rashes is like a wide topic. Uh, like I said, rashes. Okay. Itching alone can happen due to elevated sugars. If you start getting a rash, it's more often an allergy. Whether it's an allergy to a medication or an allergy to something else, it's better to consult with a doctor. If you have itching without a rash, it may be related to high sugars. Sure. Thank you. Uh, it's also, uh, I think, very, very vital. Uh, like, you know, we talked about the skin. Now, similarly, we all know that... Uh, uh, that genital hygiene is also extremely important considering the fact that you know a diabetic patient may be throwing out uh, sugar from the urine and uh, there are you know medicines which promote you know uh, exodus of uh, sugar glucose through that route so what is the importance and you know how important is genital hygiene uh, and you know what things should be taken care of uh, for this ma'am so yeah, that's an, you know, again, an excellent question. Doctors started talking about genital hygiene when these group of medications came out, you know, which work by pushing out sugar in the urine. Till then we would never, people would come and complain to us because their sugars are high. They would have itching in their private parts, in the genital area, in the groin, or they'd come up with urine infection. The specific sort of measures that we tell them, one is uh, every time you use the toilet, make sure that you wash yourself uh, and, and dry yourself. Uh, in general, it's better not to use talcum powder or powder because that has formed, that has been shown to be causing a type of cancer, particularly in women. So it's not a good idea to put powder inside your, in our country, we tend to do that because it's hot and it's moist and a lot of women suffer from itching in their private parts. A good way to get rid of the itching, uh, first of all, control the sugars. Talk with your doctor because sometimes we use certain creams to control the itching. 
prevention is good. So how do we prevent it? Keep that area dry. You know, every time you use the toilet and wash yourself, particularly for women, this is the advice. Dry yourself, just pat yourself dry and make sure that the underpants are dry after you've used the toilet. Keeping the area dry prevents the fungus. Most often the itching happens because of a fungal infection. Moisture, again, fungus likes a moist area to grow. Uh, if the area is dry, it is not going to grow. So keeping the area dry is very uh, important and essential. And not, not just applying like, you know, uh, talcum powder again the same thing applies even to the groin area the same advice also have, applies to men a lot of men also particularly suffer from itching at the you know the tip of the penis or in the groin area again basic hygiene measures like this you know keeping yourself dry after you use the toilet just using a cloth is a good idea to or using toilet paper though you know personally i feel for environmental reasons i think it's better to use a cloth uh so using a cloth to keep yourself dry after using the toilet is a simple way to prevent infections. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think very important tips. Minor things, many a times, you know, we even, you know, refrain from discussing this and we suffer. But it is important to discuss this with your doctor. Take, you know, the right advice and manage yourself well. I think uh, Dr. Jashri has explained this uh, very beautifully uh, today. Ma'am, another, you know, important thing uh, to be taken care of, and most diabetic patients are aware of that, by the way, and that's about, you know, the foot, because their doctors will tell them, that, you know, don't go up. Uh, uh, let's say, you know, in, in, a, in a place without wearing shoes or so, because if you get hurt, you may not come to know. So, and we see like, you know, diabetic amputation, diabetic foot amputations happening, patients getting suffered. Uh, anything you'd like to, you know, highlight uh, on this topic that how does a patient takes care of his feet? And then if he is diabetic and, you know, he's already had some bad experience with the foot, uh, you know, is there any guidance on what kind of footwear to be used or, or any specific, you know, guidance you'd like to give uh, here? Sure. So uh, I think I'd already mentioned the skin earlier. Make sure that you're not developing cracks in the heels, particularly uh, in our country, a lot of women walk around barefoot. If you go to like rural areas, you'll find a lot of women and men having deep cracks in their heels. So the, those cracks are the places through which infection can enter the foot. So it's important that we try and prevent the cracks from occurring by, like I said, applying relatively cheap measures like, you know, this paraffin wax, wearing footwear at all times, chapels at all times, properly fitting chapels. I'll come to chapels and shoes in a minute, but wearing protective footwear at all times, particularly when you go out, maybe inside the house, if the house is clean and you're not going to be stepping on, uh, you know, sharp things without your knowledge, you don't need to wear. But in general, it's good practice to have one pair of footwear for inside the house and one pair of footwear for outside the house and always wear footwear as much as possible. Now, in our country, a lot of people go to temples. So what I tell them is wear a pair of thick socks when you go to that temple. A pair of thick, not very tight fitting, but not very loose also. So get the proper pair of socks. Spend some time, it's okay. The, let the sole be somewhat thick. You can wear the socks when you're walking and this particularly applies to people who already have problems with their feet. Let's say they have... Uh, what we call neuropathy, nerve changes, or they have what are called callosities, you know, the thickening of the skin uh, near the place where the toes join the feet. So if they already have had things like this, it means they are more prone to ulceration. So wear socks, even if you're going to go barefoot in some place. Socks are a good way to at least protect the immediate damage to the skin. Get into the habit of looking at your feet daily. We are all in, in you know, we like to look at our face we should spend that much time to look at our feet, particularly look at the underneath of the feet. Now, a lot of elderly people cannot really turn the toe, cannot flex the ankle to look at the bottom of the feet. One simple tip is, even if you're keeping your feet like this, keep a mirror underneath it. Look at the mirror. See if there is any area where you're developing calluses uh, or, or you know, thickening of the skin, any redness of the skin. So just use a mirror to take a look. Spread the toes out and look between the toes, in between the webs of the toes. Again, that is a place where infections and cracks and uh, uh, cracks in the skin and infections can enter. So look between the toes. 
after a bath make sure that you dry well between the toes such a simple thing they will dry everywhere else they'll just leave this like this and then they'll wear their shoes and there'll be accumulation mm. of moisture between this you know between the toes and that is where again fungus likes to grow that is why they have intense itching between the toes so after a bath just again use a cloth and just dry between the toes before you wear your shoes so don't let moisture remain on your skin so this is all regarding the uh, just the skin now very important is the nails make sure you don't clip the nails too close to the finger leave at least about like say a 2 mm gap uh between the nail and the thing and i personally do not at all like this idea of people with diabetes going for a uh, pedicure because this pedicure is one place where they really scrub your feet and we've seen you know it may not be very hygienic so it's not a very safe thing unless it's done by someone with expertise in doing it properly and without causing damage to the feet of the people with diabetes so please be careful before going for a pedicure and they also file your nails all that is not good all you need to do is just trim the nails you should not be developing in growing toenails in growing toenails develop when you cut the nails very close to the skin if you sort of i don't know if you can see if you sort of keep cutting it here so you don't need to do that just let it be straight like that let it it's okay if you have a little bit of that white bit showing that's all right particularly in the feet let a little bit of that white bit show a lot of people with diabetes elderly people particularly with diabetes have very thick uh particularly their their toe nails and other nails will be very thick and hard and grow out a lot and you cannot cut it easily get a podiatrist go to a place which has a podiatry service it will be worth it even if you have to travel for a while it's okay you have to soak the feet and then sometimes use like really special nail trimmers to be able to cut the nail off it's not easy to cut it with just the nail clippers but even even if the nails are all right make sure that you leave a little bit of place don't do in don't cut it too close don't dig the nails on the side don't try and dig out the dirt and all from that so this is with respect to basic hygiene measures mm-hmm. now you spoke about footwear yeah. chappals very very essential that your feet when they are at rest they should not be compressed inside the shoe they should not be pushed together they should be allowed to be flat when your feet are flat keep your foot flat on the ground and see how the toes play out we call this playing out they are just slightly spread out there will be a little bit of gap when you wear your shoes when you wear your footwear ideally your your toes need to remain like that between the edge of your the biggest toe and the edge of the footwear there should be at least half an inch of space you should be wearing shoes which grip your feet your feet should not be gripping the chappals or the thing so ideally i tell people to wear sandals or completely covered footwear particularly people who have severe neuropathy and who cannot feel the uh, if their sensation is very bad and they cannot feel it it's better to have chappals like sandals certainly with something with heel support which grips your feet now podiatrists are extremely in short supply in our country it's a huge huge it's it's such a well developed specialty in some other countries around the world in our countries in a few places in the few specialty centers you have good podiatrists otherwise we don't have good podiatrists podiatrists are the people who tell you what type of exactly shoes to buy but even if you don't i have access use these common sense measures make sure that the shoe is broad it should not be narrow and compressing your feet even even 2 hours of wearing a tight shoe like that will cause abrasion on the skin and cause problems so wear chappals and shoes you should always not be worried about the i would say not be worried about the cosmetic aspect of it what you should be worried about is the safety aspect and the comfort aspect of the shoes so make sure that the shoes are well fitting try to go for your shoe fitting in the evening in the evening remember that your shoe size is slightly larger your feet swell up by the evening so go for your shoe fitting in the evening rather than in the morning when your feet are very small some little you know things because the feet swell up because of fluid accumulation and keep all this in mind make sure that it is not compressed make sure that the front of the shoe is also very broad and not narrow these are all some simple tips that you can use 
I think uh, we are receiving a lot of thank you messages uh, today on the chat. I think people are really uh, loving it. Uh, these are very, very minor things, but so very important for a patient to know. And, and many a times, you know, when we meet our doctors, there's not so much of time available to ask these, you know, things from the doctor as well. And I think we are lucky today to hear this in so much of detail from uh, Dr. Jashri. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, she talked about, you know, the footwear, See, podiatry, uh, podiatrist, uh, it's it's a footwear, diabetic footwear is very, very important. Uh, if you will, you know, search around in your city or if you will talk to your doctor as well, you know, they will guide you like, you know, where you can uh, get, you know, these specialized uh, services. Uh, many of us, we go to, you know, temples uh, where we, you know, go barefoot and she earlier talked talked about the importance of wearing a socks so socks is just not like you know something which you are wearing it's a protective gear for your foot uh, when you are going to temples and you know i would also recommend that many a times we go to temples our socks get wet while we are there and then you know we keep on wearing the same thing uh, throughout the day don't do that maybe you know Take it as a protective gear, wear it, you know, while you're in a temple, while you come out, change it, have another pair of it. And uh, would that be appropriate to say that? Absolutely right. That's an excellent point. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Uh, let's move forward, uh, you know, from these things, ma'am. And, and, you know, a lot of diabetic patients, uh, they would be taking insulins. And we know that... Uh, insulin you know there are syringes if someone is taking with a vial or there are pens available uh, can you guide us like you know where because these are used you know multiple times also these syringes is this pens uh, how do we you know keep it safely uh, first of all uh, we would like to know so that the basic hygiene of the insulin device or syringe only is not compromised and secondly any tips you would like to give us you know for the insulin taking patients that how frequently they should change the needle and on the on the body parts, you know, where they are taking insulin. So how do we take care about you know those parts uh, so that they don't, they are not hurt? So let me start with the storage first. Uh, uh, ideally, insulin should be stored in a relatively cool area. If you have access to a fridge, you can put the insulin in the door of the fridge. Never freeze your insulin. If the insulin has been frozen, it should not be reused. So the insulin should only be kept in the door of the fridge at 4 degrees centigrade. If you do not have access to a fridge, one simple thing which has been suggested in our country is put the, uh, the insulin, the pens or the, or the vials or the syringes in a plastic cover, nicely tie it up and keep that inside a pot, which has, been, uh, which has got water at the bottom. It will be relatively cool inside that pot. So in case you're in an area where you don't have access to a fridge, this is one way of keeping the insulin somewhat cool. Uh, the, the insulin needles ideally need to be changed uh, at least every two to three times because by the time you come to the third injection, the sharpness of the tip will be lost and you have to exert more pressure to give it. But I know people, a lot of my patients tell me that they reuse the needle even for a week or 10 days uh, and that is not on. Just keep a, keep a rotation. You have to be a little bit organized about this. So just say every two days, I'm going to change the needle. No matter what, you just change the needle because otherwise the tip becomes bent or it becomes blunt and you have to exert a lot of pressure and then the whole syringe bends. So all that can be avoided if you change the needle at least every three to four injections. And uh, uh, with regards to... Uh, what is the other thing? Yeah, one other thing I wanted to say, in our country, we don't talk much about how do you dispose of the needles. We just tend to throw it away. It is important that you have, and nowadays you get this in our country, you have a special insulin disposal sort of uh, boxes. I'm sure you've seen them in hospitals and in nursing homes or in labs, you know, where after they take your blood, they put it into one, there's one thing which clips off the needle and then the syringe goes in. That is now even available for home use. It is not very expensive. That even if you don't have that, you can get a thick, uh, uh, you can get a thick bo uh, uh, plastic bottle. You know the one that's made of thick plastic. For example, the one that is used to hold detergent, uh, bathroom detergents. You know the thick bottles. So you can use that which has a big top. Take it out and put the whole. Uh, if you're using a syringe and needle, put the whole syringe inside. Uh, if you're using a pen, take off that needle and put it inside. So you need to collect it in a safe container. 
it is not on to just put it in your garbage where it makes its way and it can be hurting you know wildlife because a lot of this garbage is going to go out to the sea so it will be hurting the wildlife so collect it in a container and ideally you can you're supposed to take it to and if you look at the indian guidelines the indian there is something called the forum for insulin uh, uh, technique it's called the fit india campaign you can go online and look at that website it tells you once the sort of bottle that you have has been filled up or the container has been filled up you have to take it to the nearest healthcare facility and they should be able to dispose it off for you because a lot of the hospitals or uh, government hospitals will have a facility for disposal proper disposal of biomedical waste so we need to make sure that uh, this is not something we commonly talked about talk about with our patients but you need to make sure that you're collecting it in a safe place and disposing it off you know i'll be happy if other people who use insulin on a regular basis in the audience if they write in and say if they share other tips as to how they are disposing of their insulin uh, needles make sure to rotate the sites uh, we were talking about hygiene earlier you do not need to apply alcohol on the skin before you inject yourself as long as your skin is you have a bath every day and your skin is clean just you know push the cloth aside and just take the injection uh if you have taken an injection at a particular spot the next injection should be at least 2 inches away from that spot ideally you need to rotate again if you sort of go online and look there are lots of charts available telling you how to rotate the sites people who for example need to take their injections four times a day they will have a chart which tells you how to rotate it they'll even give you a chart for a whole month telling you how to rotate it you can keep that chart against your abdomen or against your thigh and it will tell you where to inject on each day so if you do day 1 here day 2 here day 3 there so it has to be separated out if you go to the same site again and again and inject it that injection site becomes thickened why is that important if that injection site is thickened your insulin is not going to enter your body your blood sugars will not come under control they will remain high so you will keep on increasing your dosage of insulin to no effect why because the site where you're taking the injection is not proper so make sure you rotate the sites make sure you change the needles and even after using it make sure that you dispose of the needles and the syringes in an appropriate manner yeah i think very very important uh, thing which you have covered because a lot of people they take insulins and it's important for them to be aware of this i i think we have covered almost you know the whole uh, uh, topic today and you know we started right from as we you know said head to toe and uh, you elaborated about you know how should we take care of uh, how a patient or a caregiver should be aware about you know managing the skin properly or uh, you know you talked about the genital hygiene the foot care and you also you know shared with us uh, you know how to take care you know don't dig too deep in the air and and maybe you know the the cutting of nails etc uh, i think we have come to now the end and the closure of this and i must thank you uh, dr deshri for being so elaborative and so specific also in highlighting to the patients that why hygiene matters in diabetic patients and what all you know they should be taking care of uh, while you know we uh, end this program uh, i'll once again you know invite you for you know anything which we have missed out which you think it is important for patients to know and if you would like to summarize the whole thing today uh, before we say good night to our audiences yeah thank you one a very important thing that i did miss out on is oral hygiene uh, yeah. i think we are all aware that uh, uh, you need to have good proper teeth and dental hygiene people with diabetes are prone to a number of gum problems they are more prone to gingivitis and and dental caries so it's important to brush your teeth ideally after every meal but at least even twice a day so you know what our grandmother and our mother used to tell us brush your teeth twice a day brush your teeth before you go to bed is particularly important for people with uh, diabetes so oral hygiene is one thing that i forgot to mention but it's important that we brush our teeth twice if not three times a day so that's essential even if you're not able to brush your teeth after every time you eat have a good rinse of your mouth you don't want that food particles stuck there because again that is where the bacteria likes to live so have a good rinse of your mouth even if you're not able to spit it out nicely rinse your mouth and swallow the water uh, at least that way you're removing the more uh, bigger food particles which may get lodged somewhere and form a nidus for infection so make sure that you're doing that don't pick your teeth with those toothpicks again very common for mm. that to happen and cause an infection so try
but not necessary. The best teeth pick you have inside your mouth, your tongue. Use that to nicely go inside and you can spend your time taking it out. So don't put sharp things into your mouth as much as possible. I think I covered everything, but I forgot dental hygiene, so I wanted to mention it. Yes, <laughs> very, very, very important, I think. Uh, yeah. So guys, I think we all need to learn how to use our tongue uh, instead of a toothpick. So that's going to be very interesting as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Jashree, uh, on that note, thank you so very much. And I can tell you that, you know, we're going to archive uh, today's session because these are the things which we talk very less while, you know, talking about diabetes management. And uh, you have been very, very kind today in, uh, you know, sharing all these details with us. Thank you so very much. And I thank all the viewers as well who are connected live or who are going to, you know, see this uh, program this is going to stay on the Facebook page and, of course, also on the YouTube as well. Any of you uh, who is new to this, you know, channel or this platform, or if you know uh, your, you know, known ones who are diabetic and you think that they should be uh, hearing all this, you just need to go to Facebook, just type Beyond Sugar out there. And once the page opens, you just need to press the like button or follow button. And you would be getting, you know, all this post and all this, you know, expert talks as well uh, live. So with this, I thank everyone who is joining today or going to see this later on. I thank you once again, Dr. Jashree, for coming on this platform and talk to us and talk to all the viewers. Thank you so much and good night. Good night to everyone and good night. Thank you and good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.